Hi, my name is Jim. Welcome to uh, MOSFETs Part 2 and uh, we're also going to be talking about mathematical limits. Um, what you should have gotten out of the MOSFET Part 1 is an understanding of the way an end channel FET turns on, that the gate to source voltage has to be greater than the threshold voltage, uh, the, uh, the graph of V gate to source versus the drain current, and also the graph of the V drain to source um, gate to source uh, versus uh, drain current. You should understand that P channels are basically opposite that of N channels where the gate has to be more negative than the source by a value more negative than the threshold voltage. <clears throat> now we're going to get into um, MOSFETs again today but we're going to be talking about the transition before we were just talking about the static characteristics so these are the dynamic characteristics when the MOSFET is being switched on and off as it would be in a typical switch mode power supply under some control like pulse width modulation which is very very popular but before we get into that let's just take a look at MOSFET extremes and uh, what I did is I got on the internet and searched for the highest voltage MOSFET I could find and that was uh, made by a manufacturer named Diexus part number 2N450 where the V gate to source voltage and this is an N channel device <coughs> uh, is equal to 10 volts full on it's guaranteed 10 volts is guaranteed to turn the part on V drain to source max is a whopping 4500 volts ID max equals 2 amperes so that, that's an awful lot of power that's going to switch. RDSI max is a large 23 ohms and what that has to do with is physically uh, the gate and the source as they were embedded in the P type material you know, being end channel uh, wells if you will have to be moved apart for this high voltage so it doesn't arc across and therefore the channel uh, that conducts electrons, virtual uh, end channel underneath the gate is longer and then we pick up that uh, that length of 23 ohms to be able to withstand that voltage. On the other side of the coin looking at high current I found an IAXIS uh, VM01200 VGS full on again is guaranteed to be 10 volts VDS max, drain source maximum voltage is 100 volts I drain max is 1245 amperes. Now that means this part has to have really big contact area to be able to switch that kind of current. RDS on max, I was amazed at this, 1.35 milliohms. That's 1.35 e to the negative 3 ohms. This part cost $97 a piece. This part cost $157 a piece. So that's about the biggest you can go with MOSFETs today. Tomorrow I'm sure there will be something better. Um, and when MOSFETs came on the scene, they obsoleted bipolar power transistors. They're basically gone. This has so many positive effects compared to bipolar power transistors they're hard to get. If you're going to replace one say in a stereo output stage you would need to get it from uh, a company like NTE who deals in obsolete parts. Now we get into this transition um, we're dealing with here is what's called dynamic capacitance and that means that not only isn't a physical part there but it's being multiplied um, also referred to as the Miller effect and these are all stray capacitors and remember that a capacity can be between any two conductors separated by an insulator so they're not desired but they're there and we have C gate to source which we're not too concerned with C drain to source it's there this guy C gate to drain bad this is the one that gets effectively multiplied um, as we'll see here in a minute. So if we have a source here, I'm going to use a little 9 volt radio battery and I'm going to show this as being a typical 
power source, not a perfect one, with our internal here. Um, all real power sources have some internal resistance, and that's why the dots. If I close the switch here, this potential has to charge this capacitor, along with this guy, but I'm not worried about him. This is the big one that's going to be pro uh, a problem. So uh, CG, uh, Seagate, the source, is really a bad thing. And uh, it's called Miller Capacitors, like I said before. It's parasitic. It's really not wanted. And it's uh, basically multiplied by what I'll refer to as the gain of the circuit. Uh, <clears throat> the reason the AM band stops at 1.6 megahertz is that the amplifying devices of the day, vacuum tubes, couldn't operate above that frequency stably because of this guy. It's called something else. We need not get into that. But uh, So that's why the AM band stops where it does today. And then an uh, engineer named Hazelton figured out a way around it, but the circuit was more complex and uh, it worked well. And he had his day in the sun and then technology kind of uh, passed that solution up. So what this means is that the gate drive, meaning this guy here, has to provide high drive currents um, on transitions. Uh, that is when we go high to low and low to high. So when we're going to be switching the FET, is it's up to the driver circuitry to be able to deal with charging this guy. Um, so our the key formula here is that the charge, Q, in Coulombs, and um, I got a little note here, be careful with C, because C is capacitors, of course, and is also the unit for charge, so I'll try to have the word Coulombs where I mean Coulombs. Q equals CV, and the circuit we have here is a 10-volt battery. Notice it's perfect, perfect voltage source. R internal equals zero a perfect switch, no resistance anywhere, and a perfect capacitor. And for easy math, I made the C equal to 1 farad. Throughout this, you are to assume that VC initial is equal to 0 volts. So we're not starting out with any charge on the capacitor whatsoever. So 1 Coulomb is a refresher equals 6.24 E 18th electrons. Not electrons per second, that's current flow. This is just electrons, a collection of electrons on a metal surface here, like my producer. Anyhow, back in AC circuits, uh, when you studied RC circuits, and this is a series RC circuit, as it basically kind of looked like this. This is 10 volts. I guess I can straighten that V up a little bit. Like that, there we go a resistor and a capacitor, and then what we learned is that if you turned on the switch at T0, again assuming the initial voltage was zero, is what would happen is the capacitor would charge asymptotically toward 10 volts. Now what that means is that after one time constant, so this would be tau equals one, is that you would be 63 percent of the way toward your final voltage. And at your second time constant, tau equals 2, the difference between this point and this point, you would be 63% of that, and so forth. So what the industry says is after 5 tau, somewhere over here, 5 tau, is you could consider the capacitor to be fully charged. Now the time constant, tau equals r times c, and the units for this is seconds. So this is kind of what you've been exposed to. Um, <clears throat> and if we take a look here back into figure one, is what we see is that since we have no resistance in the circuit, uh, tau is equal to zero seconds. So the time constant of the circuit being zero means that the capacitor is going to charge in zero seconds. Yeah. Perhaps not, but we'll see what happens. Okay, figure one again. Uh, for sines and cosine waves, for AC circuits, you learn that the capacitor reactance was equal to 1 divided by 2 pi Fc, or you could express that as a quantity, 2 pi Fc raised to the negative 1 power, would also be the opposition to current flow through a capacitor for only sines and cosines. Now, this was developed from the general equation for a capacitor, 
Uh, and this will work with any waveform, and that is equal to, that. well, in years, the capacitor current, IC, is equal to the value of the capacitor, C, in farads, times the rate of change of voltage, and that is expressed in calculus as dV dt, and if you need to think of this as the delta V, uh, divided by delta T, except this is instantaneous with zero width, but same thought. So what we could say about this is I is proportional to the rate of change, and this is the key word here, is dV dt is the rate of change. So the faster the voltage changes across the capacitor, uh, the more current is going to flow in it. So, uh, since R equals zero and tau equals zero, the capacitor current, so that would be the guy flowing in here when we flip the switch, is equal to C, which is one farad, times 10 volts, divided by zero seconds, because the time constant is zero. We have a difficulty here. We have an undefined charging current. What does that mean? That could be undefined. Close the switch, 10 volts is across the capacitor. But nevertheless, the math is saying, hey, there's a problem with this. So what we need to do to figure this out is to use a concept of math called limits. And what limits uh, does is it gives us or points to an answer as the independent variable, uh, in this case that would be the time, uh, approaches a number. For example, if we had y equals 2x squared, and we said that uh, what is the limit of 2x squared as x approaches 3, well the limit is 18. Now, this may seem very obvious and easy and you know what good are limits, but let's take a look at this um, function here. You know, we've got two asymptotes sitting about 2. As we approach this value from the left, what are we going to end up with? If we approach this value from the right, what are we going to end up with? So limits is very helpful in things like this is where you know you're dealing with some kind of anomaly that's happening. In this case, uh, it uh, x equals two. So if we take this and take a look at the trend, um, and what we have here for a basic equation is y equals ten over x, and then I did the breakout table. You know, it's like the good old days. And uh, what we see is, is x gets smaller and smaller and smaller, y gets larger and larger and larger. So as x gets smaller, y is trending large. So what happens when y equals zero? Well, what we can say is the limit as x goes to zero, based on this situation, is equal to infinity. Does that make sense? I mean, we could, we could keep going with this through the floor and get larger and larger numbers here and uh, eventually if we do hit zero although it's mathematically defined undefined is we can say that the limit as it approaches zero keyword is equal to infinity so let's go back to my my bad example here um, so we'll take the limits and now we'll put it in this circuit and the capacitor current is the limit as the change in time it's going to be the time it takes to go from low to high, switching the switch closed, uh, goes to zero, of our equation here is equal to the limit of one farad times the change in voltage, which is 10 volts, divided by dt, which we let go to zero, is equal to infinity. Now what that means is when the switch is closed, an infinite current flows for zero seconds charging the capacitor. Yeah, you probably need to be drinking a little bit to read that and make any sense out of it because it doesn't make sense physically. But that's what the math tells us. Or perhaps not. Now, realistically, we can never have a circuit like this because there's always going to be some resistance in it. But this is kind of going to set us up and it kind of legitimizes this circuit for what I'm going to present next. So what, what I didn't want to do is present this circuit as if it could really be built. And all of this stuff with limits has to do with kind of displaying this as being um, 
a good instruction tool for Miller. That's that's what it's about. So uh, what we have here, getting back to business here, is when a switch is closed, we have a change uh, on C, and that uh, total charge is now equal to 10 coulombs. So when we switch that guy, um, it's going to end up being 10 coulombs. Now suppose that we take our circuit figure one and do note that this side of the capacitor is working against ground. And in this circuit, what we're going to do is have an amplifier with a gain of negative 10. Now, what that negative means in an AC environment is the, say, sine wave input is 180 degrees at the output of the amplifier. In this sense with DC, it simply means that plus 10 volts is going to be amplified by 10 and the output is going to be negative, or the opposite uh, sign. <clears throat> so this plate of the capacitor is now working against the output of the amplifier and the value of the capacitor is still one farad and we're calling this point A and this point B. So the circuit probably doesn't look very comfortable but we'll make sense out of it in a minute. When a switch is closed point A is equal to 10 volts, we can see that, and uh, point B is equal to negative 100 volts. So the plus 10 volts here is multiplied by negative 10 and we end up with a negative 100 volts and a plus 10 volts here. So what we can say about that is that um, the voltage cross capacitor is 110 volts. And we can kind of see that's true because if we take point A and subtract from it point B, it'll be 10 volts minus a negative 100 volts is going to be 110 volts. And right now I don't care about polarity. So uh, what we could say then is the Q, this is a total charge on the capacitor. Remember, the driver's got to supply this. That's the key to hold this whole thing. Is equal to CV, is equal to 1 farad times 110 volts. Now gives us a charge in that capacitor of 110 coulombs. So if we take this and wiggle it around a little bit, is what we can do is say that the total charge, Q, is going to be equal to the gain of the circuit, this guy, plus 1, this guy, times C, times the source. So what it looks like, the Miller capacitance, is whatever that value is, it's multiplied by the gain of the circuit plus 1. So a high gain circuit with a relatively small C can look very, very large. And MOSFETs, uh, 3 nanofarad, which is a large value, really, because remember we have all those little transistors in parallel, you know, it can be quite, quite a difficult thing to, uh, to charge. So this is called the Miller effect here, and there's four dimensions to the Miller effect, and this is one of them. So the question is, is how, do, how do we really drive a MOSFET at an appreciable um, a speed. So uh, if we look at this now, if uh, we're going to assume here is that RD assign equals zero ohms, and that'll just make the calculations a little simpler and we don't have to be concerned with things, is that here we have our C gate to drain and what this is about is to figure out what's going to happen in a physical circuit as opposed to you know that writing I had on the previous page. So we're going to close S and what we see here is that point A is going to go from 0 to 10 volts. Okay, that makes sense. Um, hitting this plate of the, the uh, parasitic capacitor. And the drain now, this is important, when the device is off is 100 volts. The Fed is off, it's opened. This is 100 volts. When we turn it on, this conducts and shorts the drain to the source. So the drain is going to go from 100 volts down to 0 volts. That's a change of 100 volts. So this side of the capacitor, point A, is going from 0 to 10 volts in the positive direction and the other side of the capacitor is going from 100 to 0 volts in the negative direction. So here we see the same thing in an actual circuit that we had on the previous page. 
both sides of this capacitor are moving voltage-wise. So, um, V, this guy, has to provide the current to charge this capacitor. And that's really kind of a challenge if you're operating at some high frequencies. So, In transition, let's say that the switching frequency is 100 kilohertz, and we have a lazy turn on time now. What that would mean is that um, this is going to be, say, a square wave generator, and I've got a resistor here feeding the FET. And this is our CGS. So now we have a time constant of R, C, gate to drain. And a time constant is going to slow down the turn on time. So that's what I mean by the word lazy. <clears throat> so uh, let's take a look at this point. And what we have is that we're starting with the device off. Well, V drain equals VDD. Um, in this case, 10 volts. And since the device is off, is that the current in the drain in blue is virtually zero. So if we analyze um, the power at this particular point, it is very close to zero. We have this much volts and virtually zero current flowing, so when it's off, it's hardly dissipating anything. Now, when it's fully turned on and pinch off, the drain current comes up to its terminal value, which in this case would be 2 amperes. Um, and the drain voltage would drop down to um, a low value sorry a meter just shut off I thought it was a camera uh, a low value here which would be basically the voltage divider uh, having to do with the RDS on and the uh, uh, load resistance and since we're talking about here ID squared times RDS on, is this is also going to be low power. But look what happens in transition. Say this point and this point as these two values are multiplied together. So if I were to sketch the power curve for this, is what I'd see in red is it would be low, come up to some maximum, and then kind of return to be low again. Now, this happens 200,000 times a second and can account for most of the heat generated by the FET. So, um, a circuit that can't charge this quickly causes the part to run hotter. Now, suppose that I had a real powerful source here and there was no resistance so this could support a lot of current flowing in both directions what that would look like in dotted green and this is going to be for the drain voltage is we hit turn on and he would fall quickly and as far as the current is concerned in blue when we hit turn on he would rise to the terminal value quickly. And that means that the total power during the transition here of turn on would now look something like uh, this. And you can see that would be much less with all due respect to my sketching skills. So by turning it on hard and fast keeps the FET cooler than slow. And that's all has to do with the ability of the drive circuit to charge and discharge C gate to drain stray quickly. So um, that's uh, basically what that's about and um, in turning on a, a FET is um, this is a typical circuit that would do it effectively and it's an NPN PNP uh, relatively low power transistor drivers where the signal current now, the base current, I had it slowing in both directions, 
uh, for both transistors here, one then the other, <coughs> is um, amplified by the beta plus one here and the beta plus one there, and usually can source a lot of current into a, a FET to uh, turn it on and off. And uh, we've got here a, a circuit that um, designed a while ago. And what, what this guy is, is it's capable of ringing a telephone. I think I brought this up in a previous uh, video for a throw phone for the police department. And I need 86 volts RMS to do that. And uh, this little transformer here takes 12 volts, which are switched by this FET, and steps it up to 80 some volts um, at uh, 20 hertz in a square wave form which is then switched onto a telephone line and it looks from the standpoint of a phone and I'm talking about the old ringer types as if it's getting a 20 hertz 120 volt peak sine wave riding on top of negative 48 volts so uh, this is seeing it says a 100 volt breakdown on this um, on this FET and seeing a pulse out of the transformer of 60 volts and I buy these bobbins and um, acquired a uh, sewing machine motor and put a little counter on it and then I'm winding these in the basements and put the uh, primary turns on it and so forth and this is all controlled by a little processor here this is a pick and the big processor which you can't see simply says okay start the phone to ring and in the United States it rings for two seconds called a power ring cycle and it's silent for four seconds so it's on a uh, six second period um, <coughs> had some major troubles with this, so I'll just mention it, is sometimes it would ring the phone for 20 minutes without a problem and fail, and sometimes for 20 seconds. And I could not find out why. And I did everything to clean up the, the grounds. Um, I actually cut the ground going to the process and ran 12 gauge house wire to it. Usually I can find these. This is one I could. So I ended up doing a second circuit board on this, and I took the first one and I put a noose around it and I had it hanging from the, uh, the ceiling here just to get even with it I suppose. Uh, we charged $2,200 for uh, designing that and uh, we ended up with a prototype that worked very well and uh, we sent it to uh, our client who was working with the police department and he was very pleased with it and I didn't hear from him for a while and then he called one day and said I'd like to order some large number of these and we're talking four thousand dollars a piece on this and this is in completely built in a cabinet and everything and he said that he had brain cancer and needed to spend down his savings to fifteen hundred dollars and this is this is a, a pot of money for our little company there are only two of us in. and uh, I told him to talk to a lawyer and he did and he didn't buy those and he died in 2011 so. Uh, I suppose dollar-wise we probably made about 1600 on that, uh, assuming that the labor cost would be zero. And that's pretty close to uh, the time that we put into that on two circuit board prototypes. Um, was a lot. By the way, what I ended up doing with that ring signal while I'm talking about this is I generated what's called a stepped sine wave. Now it still has the same RMS, but this is zero volts. And when we shut the phone off from ringing, it happens here where the current flow in the phone is zero. So we don't get that inductive kick that came back and caused the other circuit to somehow fail. I have no idea how. Anyway, one last comment on charge, and uh, you see this a lot in the data books, is that they'll take a FET and feed it with a current source into the bed <laughs> and then for the load I'm just going to draw this as a box is they have a current sink and what that does is it eliminates any changes um, that the voltage across the fed might have on this on this circuit and the data sheet sheets will give you the gate charge in um, in cool ohms and then it's up to you to go backward from that and figure out what speed do I have to switch at and therefore what current is my driver going to need to supply. 
Now the device I just showed you switched at 87 kilohertz. So what this looks like is if we start to charge the capacitor, um, we'll reach a point, VTH, and this is going to be the charge here, Q, uh, where it uh, starts to turn on and then all of the current going into this, and this is a current source now, is being used up by the Miller capacitance as the drain current drops to zero. When it gets to zero, again, it begins to charge the capacitor. So this can only supply a fixed amount of current. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Q here. This can only supply a fixed amount of current. And when a device turns on, since the effective capacity of this is now much greater, is that current can't cause any more voltage change across anything. It's got to be absorbed by the Miller capacitance. And then once that happens, it will continue up um, charging the capacitor. So that's what you see typically on a data sheet. And if uh, you want to understand it, you probably got to sit back and look at it. But the key to remember this is this point is V threshold corresponds to V threshold and this point corresponds to VD is uh, approximately equal to zero volts and that's with all due respect to RDS on and <clears throat> when the um, drain stops moving when it's at ground this side of the capacitor is not going to change anymore and that's the whole point where it'll begin to climb again okay so uh, that'll do it for um, our little MOSFET and limits discussion. Um, and our next natural step on this would be pulse width modulation. How do we really control DC stuff using MOSFETs? So thanks for watching.